Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think we're going to get started here. Uh, thanks, everyone, so much for coming. Uh, my name is Gib Clark. I'm the coordinator of the Wilson Center's Global Health Initiative. Um, and we're really excited to be dis uh, here hosting today's discussion of human resources for maternal health. Um, for those of you who are new to the center, I um, just want to tell you a little uh, quick 30 second blurb on us. For those of you who've heard it before, um, either uh, listen more attentively or repeat with me. Um, <laughs> but many of you, I think, know it by now. But essentially, the Wilson Center is the formal memorial to our, pre our nation's 28th president. Um, it was founded in 1968 as a living memorial to President Wilson, our only president to have earned a PhD. Um, and in that vein, it brings together the world of ideas with the world of policy. Um, today's event is the second event in a series of nine events uh, that we are hosting, focusing on maternal health and family planning issues. Um, the next event will be in February on maternal health's role in health system strengthening. Uh, we don't have an exact date for that or, or um, all the speakers uh, finalized yet, so keep your eyes and ears open for an, for an invite uh, to that event as well, and we hope you can, uh, can join us then. Um, as with all events in this series, we are thrilled to be working with the generous funding and collaboration uh, from um, in Gender Health's Maternal Health Task Force, from the UNFPA, and with additional technical input from uh, USAID. Um, in addition to these events, we are posting a series of video interviews and blog posts on our website and on um, those of our partners. The first video uh, featuring Harriet Barunji of the Population Council in, in Kenya, in the Kenya office, uh, is now up uh, on our blog um, and up on YouTube um, and will soon be up on, on those of our partners as well. Uh, Harriet spoke at the kickoff event uh, in this series in December, uh, which focused on maternal health and HIV integration. Uh, for today's event, we're really excited to have three um, experts in the field um, discussing uh, human resources for maternal health. I will keep their bios short. Uh, you have longer bios available outside, and I think even more extensive uh, bios available online um, and in other places. Um, uh, Sebel Frewat is an assistant research professor in the Department of Health Policy and the Department of Global Health at George Washington University. She is the PI for the WHO uh, Global Analysis Study on the Effect of Compulsory Service on Retention of the Health Workforce in Rural Areas. And previous work in this topic includes serving as the Director of Research for the WHO study that developed a regulatory framework for task shifting. Uh, we'll then hear from Jeffrey Smith, who is an assistant professor of gynecology and obstetrics and of international health at Johns Hopkins University. He is Japago's regional technical director in Asia, overseeing the implementation of service delivery and health workforce development programs in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, previously, he worked in Afghanistan on RH and MNCH IT programs and on the reconstruction of the health system. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Pop Guy, who has served as the CEO of IntraHealth since 2004. And before that, he led their regional office in West, Central, and North Africa, uh, focusing on reproductive health, family planning, HIV AIDS, uh, management and oversight, and on forging strong uh, collaborative relationships with key stakeholders and international health leaders. And previous to IntraHealth, he was at the Peace Corps and CDC. Um, I, like I said, I'll stop there. There's a lot more t uh, about each of them available. Uh, and one more note before we get started is that you'll see a camera in the back. Uh, that is because we're webcasting this event both live and it will be up in about 10 to 14 days as well online. Uh, so when we get to the Q&A, please wait for a microphone and, and let folks know who you are and where you come from. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Seville and um, thank you all again for coming. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me to give presentation on this vital and important topic. Um, my presentation will be on human resources for maternal and child health and task shifting. Uh, before I even start the, um, my presentation, um, 
task shifting can be called many names. I've worked now many countries in Africa and Asia. It can be called task reallocation, task sharing, depending on the country that you're in. But um, I'll be giving a general overview um, regarding that. So first I'll cover the current human resources for health uh, and the status for maternal health, uh, the types of task shifting, regulation for task shifting, and, and what is meant by expanded service roles, the key lessons learned from the WHO task shifting recommendation and guideline, and the key future challenges and strategies. So what does the world workforce looks like? Um, this is a report from the JLI 2004 and from the 2006 um, Health Workforce Report from World Health Organization. And as you can see, um, there are many countries, 57 in total, that have acute health workforce shortages. And most of them are found in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, the Caribbean region, and some in Latin America. And they need 4.2 million healthcare workers as we um, um, speak now. And um, if you can see the ones in, uh, what color is there? Okay, uh, the dark maroon color are those that have low density and high mortality. So why am I showing you this first and not start from maternal and child health figures? Because I really do feel that uh, it is very important to link the different initiatives that are there for ma making pregnancy safe uh, with um, the workforce um, shortages and issues that are there. For example, in Africa, uh, according to the World Health Report 2009, statistics there are an average two physicians per 10,000, 11 nurses and midwives per 10,000. And yet, WHO has said that um, in their um, 2006 report, if a country has less than 23 healthcare professionals, which in their um, definition that was doctors, nurses, nurse midwives, per 10,000 population, they are most unlikely to achieve MDG. That MDG we're discussing being MDG 5. So this is the maternal mortality ratio, and you can see that almost it's a carbon copy of the health workforce um, data that I just showed you. The countries that have the most maternal mortality ratio are those countries that have the least health workforce in their country. Um, to s say some, for example, the Afro region, the African region, the rate is 900. The, Eastern Mediterranean region, it is about 420. The Asian region is about 450. And in the World Health, um, uh, World, um, Health Statistics um, 2009, it is written, the average global maternal mortality ratio, which is about 400 maternal death per 100,000 live births in 2005 has barely changed since 1990. So something has to give in. So um, we'll discuss that. So uh, what are the global causes of maternal mortality? I'm sure many in this room knows, know this slide. Um, it ranges from hemorrhage to infection, eclampsia, obstructed liver, and other direct and indirect causes. Um, I've worked as a general physician in India and have delivered many babies. And most of these cases, almost all I can say, they are preventable. But if we see the data also again, Good quality maternal health services are not universally available or accessible. Greater than 35% receive no antenatal care. Approximately about 50% of deliveries are not attended by a skilled provider, and more than 70% uh, receive no postpartum care during the first six weeks of delivery, which mostly hemorrhage and infection also occur. Um, Anand in 2004 has um, this uh, graph that I'm sure has been used widely over all over the world that he has correlated that there's a direct correlation between the density of health workforce in a country and maternal mortality and the other mortalities. So there are too many preventable deaths. How many are there? Um, annually, 536,000 women die of pregnancy-related complications, 99% of them being in the developing countries, most of them in these 57 countries that have been identified by WHO as having acute health workforce crisis, and only about 1% in a developed country. One per minute dies. So by the time I finish my uh, presentation, and I hope I keep to the 20 minutes I've been given, 20 women will die of causes they shouldn't die from. So what is task shifting? Um, basically, uh, the WHO has defined task shifting in four areas. I have added one, which is task shifting zero. I'll come to it at the end. 
so basically task shifting one is if a task is shifted, reallocated, shared, of whatever term it's going to be used per country, from doctors to non-physician clinicians. Basically, non-physician clinicians are what we call here um, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, or, for example, in Africa, the term that's given to them, they are found in 25 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, is mostly clinical officers and health officers. So it's called task shifting one. If a task is shifted from either a doctor, a general physician, or a non-physician clinician to a registered nurse or a nurse midwife, it's called task shifting two. If a task is shifted or reallocated or shared from registered nurse and midwives to enrolled nurses or licensed practical nurses, <coughs> I'm sorry, and uh, nurse assistants or um, traditional birth attendants or other types of community health care workers, depending how the country names them, it is called task shifting three. And if it is shifted to the person itself. If care is shifted to the person and the person takes care, some portion of the care burden is called task shifting for. Um, I will go again and discuss a little bit more about task shifting zero because lately when I travel in Asia and in Africa, there's something that's bothering me. I feel that needs to be done, especially as it relates to maternal childhood, and that is task being shifted from specialized physicians to doctors. For example, in this case, being from obstetricians to GPs, general practitioners. So what is expanded service role? Um, if I go per task shifting, the whole 20 minutes will be taken up. So I've taken only one example, and which is task shifting one, which is from a medical doctor to non-physician clinicians. It can be done in two ways, depending on the country's policies, depending on the professional council's uh, policies, and depending on different amendments. It can be done through delegation or through supervision. Uh, if a country doesn't have enough healthcare workers, enough, let's say, medical doctors. Even if they want to do it via supervision, they don't have the workforce to do it via supervision. So it's done by delegation to these um, cadres called non-physician clinicians, like assistant medical officers in Tanzania, clinical officers, health officers. Um, then, but uh, it's one thing to say shift task, allocate task, but there's an, an education component that needs to be associated with it. So either through a pre-service training coupled with an in-service training, they will have the task or the competencies ideally so that they will be given the diagnostic prescriptive case, case treatment and management authority because usually this is given to only medical doctors, so that they can do services that they never used to do before. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa in 25 countries, what we have found is that uh, some clinical officers in Tanzania, for example, in Malawi, that they can do medical care and management. In obstetrics and gynae, they can do cesarean section. They can do minor surgery, anesthesia, orthopedics, ophthalmology, and dermatology. So these are expanded service role. Uh, but all this need to be done in a sound regulatory framework. So coming back to task shifting zero and task shifting one, this is expanded service role from specialists to GPs. Um, I've been to countries where medical doctors, um, students, they do their internship, they become medical doctors. They are posted in district hospitals or lower in a primary healthcare center. A woman will come with a complicated, uh, um, a complicated case, which needs maybe cesarean section or complicated management of uh, the pregnancy, but they have not been trained in cesarean section. And yet they are posted in these district hospitals or in a primary healthcare center. Um, so, why? Because mostly this kind of surgery, simple cesarean section, obstetricians do it in a tertiary um, care hospital. So, and the same thing for non-physician clinicians. So it's very important to match tasks that are needed on, at the ground level with the competency that is needed to back it up. Um, and in order to do this, then you back one step up, then what do you do? Then one needs to review the curricula to reflect the need on the ground. One has to ask the question, what does the curricula right now reflect for different healthcare workers, starting from the physicians to the nurses, nurses midwife, and uh, traditional birth attendants. Why, why, what curricula are they being taught? Does it address the burden of disease in that country, or does it, it's just traditional, it's been, you know, been there for 20, 30, 40 years, so you know, that's the only thing that is being taught. And then, um, the, other big hurdle is there needs to be, if you if one is supposed to revise the curricula, there has to be buy-in from professional associations. For traditional birth attendants, uh, they are community-based, they are co 
the community women are very much comfortable with them. They have limited technical skills, uh, but they need adequate training, supervision, and supplies. So for example, if we talk about expand the service role, there may be many, but for example, in antenatal care, they can do risk screening. You know, they can identify in their community who are the case. There are simple things that really are killing these people. Uh, the, uh, and one thing, for example, diagnosing who has anemia, you know, in the, preg in the pregnant woman. Or they can be trained if they have a, uh, if I have a um, good background of education, they can be trained, for example, taking blood pressure to identify early on who, ha who has the tendency to develop um, eclampsia later on. And they need to be motivated in part not to keep women away from life-saving intervention due to false um, reassurance. So, um, coming to regulating health workforce uh, and who is involved, well, what does that mean? There are nine issues, there may be more, but when we say regulating healthcare workforce, there are nine issues that need to be addressed. The first being the scope of practice. What is the scope of practice expected from that particular cadre at whatever level of task shifting that they are in? And for that scope of practice, what competency should they have? And what is the standard expected care from them? And Okay, if that is answered, then how should they be trained? What is should, uh, in their pre-service training? Should they be licensed, registered, uh, certified? Should they have a continuous CME or CNE uh, standard in service training? And then the other issue comes, when deployment comes, then how are they going to be recruited, deployed? How are they going to be promoted? Who set their salary? Is their salary going to be increased because now they have more work? Um, then the working condition. Now more, they are going to do more work. Are they going to do more than the number of hours that they're supposed to work in that country, whether it is eight, 10, 12, six. And then uh, if we are talking in a decentralized country, then how is the financing of the sub-national implementation going to be addressed? And we're talking mostly in the countries who have health workforce shortages. How are they going to be supervised, mentored, and accountability have to be addressed? This is the simple chart, then it gets complicated a little bit. For each of these boxes, there are multiple stakeholders. So um, it is very important to, if for any of these initiatives, to involve the stakeholders from the beginning, to get buy-in from the beginning. So for example, if we take the scope of practice and competencies, the professional councils, the professional associations, the Ministry of Health, are important stakeholders. If we go, for example, to recruitment and deployment, the Public Service Commission, the Civil Service Commission, they are stakeholders that need to be involved. Uh, Ministry of Health by itself is not an island. The medical schools, the nursing schools, the training schools, they are not an island. There are so many stakeholders that govern and will direct their um, the, their way. So for example, if we talk about working condition, there, there are policies from Ministry of Labor, from International Labor Organization, that will influence um, the tasks that will be reallocated, shifted, and how they are going to be um, um, worked out. And there are policies. For example, there are professional practice acts. For example, Ministry of Health will have its own maternal health treatment and care policies and guidelines. The labor policies will be there. So all this have to be addressed and may be mapped out. So when we say regulation, sometimes there's a misnomer. Uh, people think maybe it's just laws, proclamation, executive orders coming from a parliament, but it can be at different levels. So it can be that, but plus it can be re just a regulation from the parliament, or it can be guidelines issued from a um, line ministry, or policies from a department or the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Education, or just program guidance from a department in the ministry. But why? is the need to develop a regulatory framework. It's one thing to say, um, allocate or um, task shift a task. It's another thing to move, as we move tasks or as we tra uh, reallocate tasks, that quality and safety is moved with it. So the first is to build national and international support and commitment. The second is to ensure quality and safety, which I've just said, in the delivery of treatment, care, and prevention. And the third is to promote the sustainability of task shifting, task reallocation practices, and to guide the development of standardized education and training programs. So what are the lessons that I have learned from the WHO task shifting recommendation and guideline? We, I was a technical advisor to develop the um, regulatory um, uh, mm, framework with my colleagues at GW. One is, it was done in the framework of HIV AIDS. 
but it has adaptability. The lessons that are learned there can be used for uh, maternal and child health um, issues. Um, it really stresses on outlining what is the task that needs to be done and what is the competency needed to do that task. And the other thing being what is uh, creating an optimal skill mix at the different care sites level. No one cadre can solve all the problems. There has to be a skill mix, um, um, an optimal skill mix to address the issue. And then the other is to develop regulatory framework for making, ensuring that quality and safety are not compromised. So what are the challenges and the strategies? Um, a picture is a thousand words, as they say. So my first slide, which shows all those countries having acute healthcare workforce shortage. And yet the WHO 2009 statistics saying that a dent has hardly been made in MDG 5. Um, it shows that there has to be a linkage between the health workforce shortage and maternal mortality. There is a huge shortage of health workforce at different levels. Okay. Um, there is no optimal skill mix at the different healthcare sites levels. Uh, competency is not matching the need on the ground. Um, there has to be buy-in for revision of curricula <coughs> to reflect the burden of disease on the country at the different level of the uh, different cadres. Um, it is one thing to say scale up health workforce. Uh, we need more workforce. But um, if you cannot retain them, especially the faculty. There are hardly any faculty in many of the schools that have visited Asia, as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the different doctors and nurses. It's, there's a huge faculty shortage. If they are not there, how, who's going to train the people? So there have to be policies that needs to be developed regarding this. And um, there needs to be a decentralization targeted moving care that is given at the tertiary care level to the district hospitals level, because the district hospitals are the one that are near to the community where most of the people live and where most of the people can go and attend um, different cares and services. And um, the other thing is, if a country scales up workforce, but if they just stay in the capital city, then we're back to square one. So there has to be policy uh, and uh, strategies to retain the scaled up workforce in geographical needed areas. So what are the policies that need to address intervention at different levels? These are depending which country one comes from. But these are basically the different care sites starting from health posts. They are called health posts if they are in the villages or health houses if they are in the urban areas. Then there are the health centers, type A and type B. Type A are usually the outpatient clinics only. And type B are those that, are, that have uh, a surgery unit built to them where minor surgeries and cesarean sections and all can be done. And then there are the district hospitals and then the regional referral hospitals. In my opinion, policies should concentrate from the district hospitals down because this is where most of 99% of the population lives. And this is where uh, care from a uh, um, that is done in tertiary um, hospitals, whether it is obstetric uh, surgeries, whether it is managing complicated cases, should be moved to the district hospitals level. If doctors or if midwives um, are posted in the health center, especially if at high P level, then care that is should that is done some of the care that is done in district hospital that can be should be moved to the health center type b level and then as well as to the health post level the reason i'm saying concentrate on these three is if one really wants to decrease the maternal mortality ratio especially by 2015 that's where most of the people live and that needs to be addressed and the other thing is um, pregnancy is not a disease so a woman should not die of pregnancy this is very much close to my heart. Um, it's not a disease. It doesn't need a new drug to decrease the maternal mortality ratio. It doesn't need new research. It just needs skilled workforce at different levels and um, health center, and then the community engagement. So there are uh, recently many global initiatives to scale up health workforce in the United States as well as in Japan has a program now. Um, but um, scaling up only, as I have said, won't solve the issue. These questions need to be answered. When one is talking up uh, country-wide scale up or region-wide scale up, one has to answer whom are they going to train? 
where are the students going to come? Are they coming from the rural area, from urban area? Who, who, who's supposed to be trained? Which cadre should be scaled up? Uh, and where will they be trained? Are they going to be trained in the capital city? And then when they finish their work in the capital city, they won't address the issues of the many population that are out there. And how will they be trained? Are they going to be trained with the traditional just curricula or with a curricula that is focused on the community needs on the ground? And what will they be trained for? And to work where will they be trained? I, I, is, is the notion just scale them up and train them? Or it is with a specific idea that you engage their curricula from the beginning, make it community-based so that they see the needs on the ground. They interact with the community during their training at the different levels of cadres, from doctors, nurses, midwives, and traditional birth attenders, the skilled ones. So um, how is that going to be addressed? And uh, how will quality and safety of service be ensured? And how will they be retained in needed areas? I feel right now we're at the junction where there's so much focus on health workforce. That's what I concentrate a lot on health workforce development from recruitment down to um, deployment and retention and linking maternal mortality. I think it's a time to grasp this uh, big movement that is out there. And I leave you with my favorite Shakespeare quote from Julius Caesar. Thank you. Okay, we're going to hold all questions until after all the presentations, so we'll just turn things straight over to, uh, to Jeffrey. I'm not sure if these are in the way, so I'm just going to turn them down for you. I keep changing it on me. There you go, slideshow. Great. Good afternoon, and thank you to the Woodrow Rosen Center for this invitation. I'm so pleased to have these issues of maternal health always on the agenda, and especially issues related to human resources for maternal health. Uh, Zebley made my presentation quite easy because she talked about the, the principles, the found, founding principles of workforce development, and I'm going to talk more or less about a specific example. I'm going to talk about how this was applied in Afghanistan, in the context of Afghanistan that we saw in early 2002 when we went in just after the conflict and began, you know, supporting the, the government of Afghanistan and USAID in putting the pieces of the health system uh, in better shape. So the general outline for this presentation discussed the return, maternal health and reproductive health situation in Afghanistan, specifically as we found in 2002, discussed the key human resource constraints, described some of the key considerations in work, workforce development and task shifting, especially with relation to maternal health, reproductive health, and then um, discuss a little bit about what we've learned and what have been some of the results of these interventions. Um, my mother told me when I was a child that I would never need a microphone a day in my life, so I'm going to modify my position here, hoping that I don't shock anybody with the level of my voice. Um, the reproductive health situation in 2002 was quite dramatic and quite concerning. High, high maternal mortality and newborn mortality, maternal mortality ratio of 1,600 per 100,000 live births, the second highest in the world, and the highest ever recorded in the prov province of Badakhshan, 6,500 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Just un unimaginable, but in fact real. Few reproductive health providers, 40% of facilities had female staff, 60% had not a single female health worker, not even a cleaner sweeper, not a single female in the facility. Only 467 midwives in the entire country, a very non-uniform qualification people during the years of conflict and isolation had been trained in three-week curriculums, two-month curriculums, and everybody seemed to be called birth attendant, midwife, etc. So real non-uniformity and very out-of-date skills. No functioning schools. The people said, yes, the schools remained open during the Taliban period, but women were not allowed to go to school. So in my mind, that's not terribly functional school. And reproductive health within the medical curriculum was de-emphasized. Um, so in general, the health system was in disarray. And the, the decision, I think this is one of the most important things, the decision early in the reconstruction uh, in Afghanistan was that midwives would be the backbone of the reproductive health workforce. And, and they would be empowered with the skills and be asked to perform the tasks necessary for provision of basic emergency obstetric care. So 
in this context of, ca of, of addressing the reproductive health situation in the country and in the, the spirit of task shifting, this is the approach that Chapaigo has always taken, making sure that clinicians have the capacity in their hands to be able to provide services in the most peripheral areas. So making sure that the worker who is on the front line has the ability to provide the services. It's not shouldn't be a temporary fix. It's not something we do now until we have more doctors. That doesn't necessarily empower uh, a cadre of health worker if you say, well, we're only going to rely on you until we find somebody else. So this is meant to be an ongoing, a long-term strategy to build professional focus and professional pride. The maternal health series of The Lancet from 2006 really said what works, what should be our focus and our strategy. A health center intrapartum care strategy in which midwives are the, f the backbone, the foundation of care. So there should be a focus on training of midwives, staffing of health centers with midwives and f adequate numbers of female health workers, and then linkages to other elements of the health system. But the foundation must be qualified health care, health workers, female health workers, midwives who have the capacity to take care of women, and the ability to provide the full range of basic emergency obstetric care services. And I think this was one of the most important decisions that the, the Ministry of Public Health in Afghanistan made in 2002, was that it clearly defined what was needed and who was going to provide that. So in, in looking at the health uh, workforce situation in 2002, there was an array of semi-skilled, partially skilled, unskilled reproductive health care workers. And there was a cry of something must be done. Something is better than nothing. Um, but in fact, what was needed was a core group of leaders and academics, a group of managers and teachers, but the bulk of the providers needed to be reproductive health care providers, people who could provide services. So again, that needed to look, we needed to look beyond cities, beyond capitals, but into the rural areas because that's where the people live and that's where the care is necessary. So there was an effort to normatize the health workforce, kind of looking at who was working as a midwife uh, or claiming to be a midwife or in a position uh, of midwife and stratifying them according, testing them, there's knowledge and skills to know who was qualified, almost qualified and not really qualified, and then uh, applying specific strategies to address their needs and redeploy them and get them back into the health workforce. So it was an, an emergency approach in the beginning, but needed to move quite rapidly towards a development approach in order to develop a, a, a professional workforce of reproductive health care workers and make sure that they went to work and stayed at work. I, I think many of you who know Japaigo know we talk a lot about standardization, especially in training and especially in curriculum. And I do think that this is incredibly important. One, another good strategy of the Ministry of Health was to adapt a single package of health services and a single unified curriculum in order to train workers to implement that package of health services. So there was a single uh, approach to upgrading the, the um, midwifery workforce, especially in a, in, in a post-conflict setting, which we found to be quite important because fragile healthcare systems don't necessarily have the luxury of, at, in the beginning, be able to choose between multiple different types of, of work, uh, workforce development patterns. So the, the elements that were, I think, so nicely described by our previous speaker about what needed to be in, needs to be in place in the health workforce system really were put in place in Afghanistan. A, a package of health services, a clearly defined number of health services that should be provided for all areas of health, but specifically in the area of reproductive health and maternal health, who should provide them, where should they be provided, what are the elements of the health system. And then the specific maternal and reproductive health service delivery guidelines about what specifically within that package of services should be provided and how. And then that becomes the content, as it were, for curricula. If these are the things that must be provided, this, and these are the people who must be trained, this is the process by which we will train them. The government developed a midwifery education policy early on that said who, who could be a midwife, how was she trained, 
uh, and what were her tasks and her job expectations. And then those schools that trained those midwives had to meet certain criteria. We were faced with a, um, a very daunting task, or, or and, and it, at some level a risky task, in 2002 when people said, yes, midwifery will be the strategy. Now go out and open midwifery schools. And there was a concern that everybody would open a midwifery school on the top floor of their house, and, and you would end up in a worse situation because we wouldn't know what was what. So there was a uniform uh, strategy for who, what was going to be a midwifery school, what would be the, the accreditation criteria for the midwifery school, and how would that curriculum be implemented. And then, of course, additional um, materials for both teaching and for assessment. So use of, stand, of these standards, or putting these standards into action, was incredibly important. As I mentioned, the accreditation system, the, the, the government took some of the, the difficult steps early on in applying the accreditation system and even closing one or two schools that it said that were donor donor supported that they said simply it's just not meeting the mark you have one teacher to train 20 students and you have a hospital that does five deliveries a month you can't have a midwifery school in this location so the government took the the difficult steps necessary to main, maintain uh, clarity about what that definition was. One of the things that was quite important was to make sure that if these frontline workers were expected to provide clinical services, their education needed to be clinically focused. In fact, the, the um, three-year midwifery, hospital midwifery curriculum was shortened from a three-year program that had a lot of um, additional topics that were not necessarily focused on performance to a two-year program that was directly focused on performance, normal pregnancy, management of complications, provision of other reproductive health services. So it focused the curriculum on specific, specifically to help these students become ready to work immediately upon graduation. As well, because of both the, the issues of um, selection, deployment, retention, but also cultural considerations, the programs were kept local. Um, the students were, were identified from the areas around health facilities where they would be working after graduation. They were brought locally to the provincial capital, not to the national capital or the big cities, but to the provincial capital predominantly for education, and then uh, returned uh, to their, their home areas in order to work in local facilities. Um, the caveat to this approach is, of course, that you need to make sure there's adequate clinical volume and educational capacity. As I said, if you, if you begin to train people in a hospital that does five deliveries a month or ten deliveries a month just because it's nearby, it's unlikely that you're going to gain competency or achieve competency there. So from the early days when there were about five midwifery schools that had been closed to the current situation uh, now, there are about um, 30 midwifery schools in Afghanistan now distributed across the country, even in the more challenging provinces that we hear on, on the, the news, Kandahar, Helmand, and places like that. So the distribution of schools is quite substantial. So what have been the results of this uh, effort to build the midwifery workforce? Um, five midwifery schools were reopened and 26 new midwifery schools were established. 1,961 new midwives have already graduated and more are in the pipeline in the schools now. 85% um, of those graduates have been successfully deployed as midwives and of those who are deployed, 86% are still working as midwives today. Health centers went from about 25% of health centers who had a female health worker to 83% of uh, health centers now have a female health worker. And 61% of health centers have at least one midwife. So deployment of midwives in the, in the country has been, has been substantial. This is from a recent uh, evaluation of the midwifery education system in Afghanistan, led by Linda Bartlett, who's here in the audience today. Um, that looked at how these midwives are working and how has their skill retention been. So just highlighting a couple uh, boxes in red at the bottom. Um, again, the total number of midwives who 
in graduated as compared to those enrolled, 93%, so fairly good throughput in the educational system. And 85% of those who have graduated have been employed or deployed. And of those who were deployed, 86%. Um, now you can see from the what's called IHS, Institute of Health Sciences, versus the CME, Community Midwifery Education Programs. The Community Midwifery Education Programs were the more provincial programs, and the IHS were the national schools run by the government that were um, in the large cities of Herat and Jalalabad, Mazari Sharif, Kabul. So the success of the local schools, the provincial-based schools, the community midwife schools, was better than the more uh, centrally located in schools in the big cities. So now this is the distribution of midwives across the country. Um, there have, they're in virtually every province. A couple of the provinces have new schools, so they don't have the density or the dis distribution of other provinces. But this also needs to be viewed with an overlay of population. The majority of the population in Afghanistan is in the, the southeast area, um, just south of Kabul. So that density is greater there. There's a, a much less population density in the southwest of the country. So this distribution is matching a little bit better, the population distribution. And here's some of the results. Um, again, these, these are in selected districts that are funded by the USAID, uh, that are supported by the USAID funded um, HSSP program in Afghanistan. But they specifically are looking at percentage of women uh, attended by a skilled attendant in 2002 versus a, uh, 2006. And in some provinces, there have been remarkable increases. In Tahar province, from 12% to 21%. In Herat, from 13 to 27% over the course of just a few years. And these numbers are continuing to increase. Um, the plan is next year that there will be a repeat uh, Ramos study, maternal mortality survey in Afghanistan. And certainly it is the hope of all of us involved in maternal health in Afghanistan that we will see a reduction in maternal mortality. One of the other things that I think was incredibly important for um, the empowerment of midwives, not simply the policy uh, initiatives and not simply the job descriptions and the permissions, the official permissions, but the concept of professionalization of midwifery. Not having, having people say, I would like to have my daughter become a midwife. I would like to have a midwife for my birth. So professionalizing and raising the status of midwives in the country. And so the Afghan Midwives Association was formed in 2005, and they're getting ready to celebrate their fifth uh, <laughs> national congress. They have provincial provinces or branches in almost every province, and they're their roles are, are to support their members as a professional organization, to, to do professional ed development and, and continuing education, but it's to help these women who are dis dispersed in health centers throughout the country feel that they are part of a network. And many of the midwives are saying, this is the first thing that I have ever belonged to other than my own family in my entire life. There is an, among the membership, there's an incredible sense of pride uh, and, and the, the, the women who are part of the Afghan Midwives Association feel bonded to each other, which I think is an incredibly important uh, step in professional development. I want to pause for a moment and just have a reflection on gender. I have to admit that I, years ago I didn't necessarily understand the term terribly well. Maybe I still don't understand the term terribly well. But when I first got to Afghanistan, there was a big push to shorten midwifery education. Why can't we just do it in 12 months? Why can't we just do it in six months? Is this really necessary, all th this two-year curriculum you're talking about, this 18-month program? No one has ever talked about shortening medical education. No one has ever said that six years to train a doctor is too long. But when it comes to training a midwife, it comes to training someone who is responsible for the care of women, we seem to think that there are shortcuts. There aren't shortcuts. The minimum time necessary to train a competent midwife to provide services is at a minimum 18 months. We've been successful with the program in Afghanistan in 18 months. We're increasing it to 24 months, but still, um, there, there, there is a bottom level that we should not go below. 
And we have to make sure that task shifting, that the idea of, of moving certain tasks to other cadre, doesn't become clinical shortcutting. That, well, we really don't need to provide care in rip manual removal of placenta. We'll just give them drugs and they can inject drugs. So we don't need to train them for quite so long. No, we have to make sure that competency remains the primary outcome. So a few conclusions. Um, for a vibrant maternal health, reproductive health workforce, we have to make sure that we're empowering midwives. Midwives form part of a, of a team, and I like some of the terms we use in task shifting or task sharing or, or gr you know, clinic groups of people who care for women. Um, but midwives need to be at the center of that team caring for mater women and providing maternal health services. We need to make sure women, midwives are empowered professionally both with, with policy from the, gov the central government, with orientation for our doctor colleagues at the facility level so that doctors don't step in and try and, and obstruct or, or block the implementation of the good things that midwives have learned during midwifery school. And we have to make sure that we train them competently and we support them to retain their skills throughout their professional life. So I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge colleagues in Afghanistan, the Ministry of Public Health, donors for this support. And the one, one of the things that made us realize that we were on to something good was that everybody wanted to open a midwifery school and every donor was interested in supporting the midwifery education program. So many donors, many supporters, and especially, most importantly, the students and the staff of the midwifery schools and the women who are, are served by these, these young women and these students. So thank you. I think we're pausing until the end for questions. You want to advance this one? Uh, yeah, or down. We're down on right now. Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. 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 Oops. 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 Sorry about yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <coughs> Um, well, the, the two previous presenters made it easy for me, too. You will see a lot of uh, the content similarity with Sebley's presentation, and it was wonderful to have in Jeff's uh, a very specific example. What my presentation is going to do is somehow quickly review the task shifting thing, which uh, Sebley has made it easy for us, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But because training is so much at the center of a lot of these things, we wanted to just bring up some ideas and challenge a little bit some of the issues that we face um, in, in the field, in, in the area of training. But I'd like to subscribe to two lessons that I've heard here. One is, totally, we invite the maternal health community to take advantage of the incredible momentum that Human Resources for Health is having right now. And there's some very good work that is being done. And it would be too bad to kind of reinvent. But I think there is a movement. And one of the lessons is to, to focus on that movement. The other one is we also subscribe to the fact that you need to pick the battle. And frankly, we know the categories that we need to focus on. And yes, we also think that focusing on the midwives as the center, uh, the category that is really at the center, is, is crucial. Uh, so this presentation will draw a lot from lessons from the USAID-sponsored capacity project, which actually is part of the good news, because ever since the JLI report was published, that's the report Sable mentioned, in 2004, was the Joint Learning Initiative. You probably know about it. Um, since then, which did the worldwide study <coughs> on the shortage of healthcare workers and why we should start paying attention. Since then, there's been tremendous progress in terms of awareness raising, in terms of people mobilizing around this. Just a few things that we know has happened since then. Okay, we know, for example, that certainly USAID has um, invest, decided to invest in this very crucial area. Uh, by creating a large global project to deal with this. We know that DFID has made massive investment or is continuing to make massive investment in this. We know that the um, uh, 
Workforce Alliance, Global Health Workforce Alliance, uh, supported by many Scandinavian countries and working uh, with WHO has been created. We know that a major conference w took place a couple of years ago in Kampala, which came up with a very strong declaration pushing everybody to embrace <coughs> national programs in human resources for health. Through the work of, uh, through the, in the investment of USAID, we now know that at least half a dozen countries in southern Sub-Saharan Africa are investing in national level human resources for health. And they are Kenya, they are Uganda, they are Tanzania, they are the regional South Africa office, and um, several of the regional bureaus are beginning to invest in that. So we do have a momentum, and I think we can, we can ride that on, on, on those. Okay, so um, you've seen this slide in Sabla's presentation. We also think it's valid, and it should be the reason why everybody should be focusing on this. It has been proven that where you have the highest density of health, work, health workers, just these statistics will improve, including maternal health, child health, infant survival, family planning. So that's why we want to work hard to make sure that we have high density of healthcare workers. Task shifting, I wanted to come back to it a little bit because there are some very powerful ideas behind task shifting. Yes, the task, the term is controversial. Yes, you have to, be, to pay attention and be careful. You're not saying that this is a solution for poor countries. You know, when the, when the, the, the policy level uh, gathering in Addis Ababa about three years ago, maybe two years ago, and all these ministers in the room, that was their reaction. You're coming up again with things that are just for us poor countries. So we have to be careful about how we talk about it, how we, what we call it, but I wanted to come back to it because there are some powerful ideas in, in here. Because if you really think about it, what I think, I, what I would focus on is this rational redistribution of clinical and other tasks, which is really what is intended. I think what it promotes is the idea of that tasks are distributed. You've covered it a little bit. You've also seen this slide earlier. I wanted to just bring it um, as a reminder. It was created mostly motivated by the HIV AIDS crisis, but the ideas behind it are powerful and very adaptable to maternal health. But this is really what we were trying to get to. We were trying to get at these four goals by task shifting, by having a policy that is kind of, distrib let's distribute these, these, these tasks. One was to share and assign tasks among health workers to take advantage of the different competencies, because it is true that you'll have different competencies according to, to the categories. We wanted to take advantage of simplified health promotion and, uh, and treatment protocols, and we wanted to shift more health promotion, treatment, and care delivery to the community level by introducing new and strengthen existing cadres of community health workers. And we wanted to increase access to care and advice in underserved communities. So if we focus on these and what is task shifting trying to do, then we can, we can take the idea further on how we design training programs and how we deliver training programs, okay? But in a very summarized form, um, what are the intervention points to increase or if necessarily decrease HR inputs? Because really that's what we're talking about. Okay, we're talking about a system where we want to develop partnership. It's not just a MOH. We know that other f sectors need to be involved, NGOs, faith-based, non-formal providers. So what are the things we want to do? We want to improve distribution of these health workers because that's part of the problems. They're just not, they're concentrated in capital cities. We don't see them in rural areas. So the distribution is extremely poor. It starts with the medical profession. We, with midwives, it's even worse because they are more mobile and so forth, and they're just not right distributed. And then we want to improve productivity, okay? Let's not forget that. It's not just the numbers. So we want to increase the interns, and we want to reduce the losses. In a sense, that's what we want to do. How do we put more health workers into the system and how do we stop the drainage, okay? 
And we also want to change the skill mix. We want to maybe include some volunteers and because we know that if we just stick with the people that were trained in the uh, professional um, uh, cadres, then we might not have enough. Okay, if we can do all of that, then we have another option, which is to modify the service delivery objectives that we have. But that's kind of really the cycle, is that you want to have enough people to be able to achieve the objectives that, 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 you, that uh, you have for yourself. Um, a lot of this presentation, I think I was asked to make this presentation partly because um, I've written a commentary on the HRH Journal of WHO talking about avoiding the same old traps. And this is just a quick reminder of some of the issues that we've been facing with in training in the, in the last 50 years or so. We know there is a perennial lack of country level coordination of health training among donors. We donors tend to be the first uh, culprit here. The, among donors, partners, ministries, and other key players. So if we do a better job at improving that coordination, we'll start solving the problem. We also know there's inequitable access to training due to gender. Uh, so the, the, it, uh, the example you gave was very telling, but it even goes down further in in-service training. Even there, where the decision is made to select who goes, uh, unfortunately, gender is also a barrier. The types of cadres, the location of the health workers, all of these are issues that hinder um, adequate training. And we know so many that these health workers spend so much time outside of their sites, and as a result, services are interrupted. So this central training location often results in deficiencies at service, service facilities, and that affect the population we're trying to help. And then finally, there's the failure to reinforce skills and knowledge. We keep forgetting that training was only designed to really deal with those aspects. But if you really want to look at the whole gamut of performance factors, uh, you need to pay attention to those as well. Okay? Now, there is another reality also that we need to figure out as we start thinking of outside of the box and saying what can we do different. Um, if we are going to prepare the next generation of health workers, yes, they are part of the Y generation, and there's a lot of implication on how we teach them and how they learn because we have also new opportunities now, let's face it. We have a lot of opportunities related to um, uh, new information technologies and new tools. Uh, so we have these things in our hands today that we did not have even 10 years ago, and it's getting better. Okay, People are talking about the broadband, but the broadband even is improving as we speak. It's improving much, much faster. So these are real. Today, we have opportunities we did not have and that we need to take into account as we design training programs. Uh, use of PDAs, the low cost, cost is coming down all the time. So we have a lot of stuff we could do. We can improve decision support. We can now reach health workers in more rural areas. Some countries are, are leading the ways. Uh, Rwanda is certainly a, a very good example of uh, a country that is making leaps in this area. So we can do a lot of these things, self-study, peer reviews. We can minimize impact on service delivery by having centralized training. Um, so let's use those. Um, so I think a lot of the, the, the two presentation and mine are saying what can we do if training and performance are really the key pillars for effective scale up. That's where we really need to pay attention to assessing the performance gap, addressing all performance factors. Um, there's some ideas about learning for performance. If you could just focus on the essential that the health worker needs to do the job. Linking pre-service and in-service training uh, was already covered and continuously looking at competency base. Okay, very quickly, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the old performance improvement which many of our agencies have embraced or are using. Just a quick remember, rem, uh, reminder that 
These are other factors beyond just knowledge and skills. Clear job ex expectations is extremely important. Clear and immediate performance feedback. Motivation is something you need to deal with. Knowledge and skills. And organizational support and what kind of environmental support will we have. So unless you deal with all of these things, you're just throwing money out of the window. Okay. Another thing to look at too is some of, some of the uh, frameworks that we have for improving performance, which is based some on the PI, is you can, you can look at it in two categories. You can look at it in terms of an instructional framework whether you are only dealing with information base, whether it's competency based, or whether you want to go all the way down to performance base. So depending on where you want to focus, you can make a decision of uh, what type of tool to use. Or you can look at a systems framework, a systems approach, which is really where I think the field tends to be going because this is not a simple word. It's very, very complex, and you really need to have a systems approach to this. <coughs> now, by having a systems approach, you also have to be specific whether you are at an individual level, at an organizational level, or at an institutional level. It's at the individual level that we tend to focus a lot on knowledge and competency, on experience and motivation. At the organizational level, um, Personnel selection, leadership, incentive of reward and reward, um, how prepared the sites are. Or at the institutional level, um, you are talking a lot about standardization and JPIGA's work in standards and procedures. That's where they become extremely important. Um, just a couple of words on learning for performance. All I'm going to do here is, is provide this information for you. It is a tool that's some work that InterHealth has been doing, gathering all this experience over the years and coming up with this uh, idea of learning for performance. But the principle behind learning for performance is that generally training curricula are overburdened with more content than we need. So if we just pay a lot of attention and distill that specific information that is needed for performance, then we can also make some gains in the training, in the training programs that we do. Anyway, this is available online. You can download it. It's a tool. It's, a, it's, it's, it's had steps and, and guides. So I invite you to look at it, those of you who are interested in instructional design process for simplifying uh, content. Um, now, Training and learning need to be looked at within the health system. And it is complex. Uh, you had actually similar presentation. This is just taking another slide of it. You have to look at the legal framework. Once you get into task shifting, it is extremely important that we have backing, that you don't have people saying, well, I don't want my midwives to be trained to do this. So that's just why you need to pay attention to the legal framework. This side, you do have the educational system, pre-service education. It's very, very complex because in some countries, my colleague was just saying that at a conference, she was finding out that in Asia, a lot of the medical, a lot of the um, nursing schools and midwifery schools or, 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 or physician might be under Ministry of Health. And we know that it's certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, they tend to be under Ministry of Education or Ministry of Higher Education. So anyway, that coordination is not always simple, but it needs to happen. Okay? And then you have the health system itself. We are also very glad that so much attention is being paid on health system strengthening, and that now we have a framework with six components that we're all adopting. And then you've got all the players. You've got the professional associations. You've got uh, and we could not repeat that more. You need to bring in the professional association. They, are, they could be such movers and shakers. Um, then you've got individuals and families and their communities, and you've got community health workers. So I wanted to bring this just to talk a, a little bit about the complexity 
of training and this whole idea of competency base, which I think we talked about, but we don't push it completely to where we could push it to. Because you do have shared competencies. Because if you start looking at the gamut of types of workers that you have, you do have shared competencies. Then you can start looking at training that way. And if you do that, well, this is just another way of slicing it. If you take the community health workers, obviously, okay, obviously at a certain point they are connected to the community nurses, and then they have a relationship with the registered nurses, the nurse practitioners. So it's like systems within systems. That's why it's not that easy. Um, so competency-based education and training puts the focus on health outcome, meeting practices need, clear task delineation, practice based on learning, describing, measuring, and managing performance. Okay? So these are some core competency areas that we could do more in, in our training. Like there is technical expertise, there's risk management, quality assurance, analytical thinking and judgment, resource management, how do you work with others? How do you achieve results? Um, how do you communicate and influence? How do you manage knowledge and information? These are actually a set of competence that you could be teaching irregardless of the type of worker you're dealing with. And they tend to be core competencies that are so important. So you can start thinking a little bit about that team approach to training, okay? And this is just my colleague, Barbara Stilwell at, at IntraHealth is very intrigued and is doing some work in, in this competency framework where by you say, well, if you just, you could look at it in terms of roles and scope of practice and specialty and then um, you've got core competency which are common to everybody and then you've got a little bit more specialization as you go. So you can actually think about this in terms of having this top of modules which then you bring as people learn more skills so that you could actually have a path for workers to work towards specializing themselves. So anyway, I'll be happy to talk more about, about this. I know we'd, we'd we are running out of time and we want to, to have some discussion. But what we seek in the end is good integration. And the reason why it's not simple is because we have to seek integration across systems. We have to seek them across roles, across courses, within learning processes, between in-service and pre-service, and above, above all, uh, for maximum adaptability. Um, so it goes kind of that way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is just a tool if you wanted to measure competency and you've got some information on how to download more information in this area. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all for great presentations. And um, let's just start off right away. Let's go for some questions. Let's start way in the back. Oh, yeah, so in the back there. Thanks. I'm Dr. Kate Talenko. I'm the Deputy Director of the Capacity Plus Project, which is USAID's new Global Health Workforce Project. And I have a question and a comment. Um, my question is, I thought it was fantastic, the number of midwifery schools that were opened up in uh, Afghanistan. I'd love to hear, were they mainly NGO-based, were they faith-based, were they government, were they for uh, private for profit, and how did the financing work, and what's the, sta the sustainability of those schools? And then the comment is, I'm very happy to report that one of the strongest movement to reduce the length of doctor's education is in the U.S. Uh, institutions as prominent as Brown and Duke have introduced six-year physician programs and in the context of health reform in the U.S., there's a movement spearheaded by the bipartisan Hope Street Group to shift away from the, or not away from, but emphasize more the DO model, um, the doctor of osteopathy model, which has more clinical based than the MD research based model, and the DOs actually spend less time in classrooms and more time on clinical work. Thanks. Do you want to answer something? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, 
USAID uh, and the government decided that the um, the midwifery schools were going to be the community midwifery schools were going to be predominantly supported by NG our donor funding. So donor support uh, was achieved for all of the midwifery schools in the country. Um, I think we always struggle with the concept of sustainability because um, I, you know if you if you're able to get other donors on board and you're able to build financing into expectations of the Ministry of Health, I think that's one element or one measure of sustainability. So the, the all of the schools are supported to some extent by donor funding. Initial uh, cost for setting up the schools was substantially more than for continuing the schools. But um, yeah, they, they and they're all NGO, or the, there are five government-run uh, schools, and the um, community midwifery schools that are provincially based are run by NGOs, not by not private. There are no private midwifery schools in the country so far, as I know. I'm going there next week. I'll find out. <laughs> okay. I'd actually like to call on Luke DeBernis here, who's from UNFPA, um, just to tell us a little bit about a conference they had uh, this last summer in uh, Ethiopia on, on this issue. Just if you could just tell us a couple minutes about that. Well, thank you very much for for this uh, this time and good afternoon. Um, yes, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good story because it shows that uh, uh, we are gaining a, a very interesting momentum regarding uh, the needs for human resources for maternal health and neonatal health, but also a consensus on what type of uh, health uh, human resources we need. And uh, I'm very grateful of all this presentation because this also is demonstration of this consensus that we have together. The story is very simple. We are working closely with the Minister of Health of uh, Ethiopia. And Ethiopia, you know, we, we have this example of Af Afghanistan, but Ethiopia is also a, a, a very uh, excellent example of the lack of access to any professional in this country. And the last uh, emergency therapy care need assessment has again shown for the second time after five years that uh, only 6% of uh, pregnant women have access to a skilled personnel during childbirth. So the, the, the challenge for the Minister of Health is absolutely huge, but the Minister of Health is himself, the Minister, is extremely committed. And they have decided to uh, go uh, for an ambitious program on training non-physician clinicians. We don't, we don't like very much this term because it seems to be negative. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, the, the issue is to train uh, medical, uh, not medical officer, uh, to train uh, health officers uh, in essential surgery, including emergency optetic care, meaning uh, cesarean section mainly. And uh, the ambitious uh, plan uh, uh, drawn by the Minister of Health was to train 3,000 NPCs in a very few number of years. And uh, we discussed a lot because it's a, a very difficult issue and we convinced the minister that it was very interesting to share experiences among different countries because we have now very well documented experiences on training NPCs for emergency optic care or essential surgery. And uh, uh, when we are talking about momentum, it's, uh, it was amazing because immediately a number of countries wanted to participate in this exercise of sharing experiences and learning from each other. And finally, 29 countries were present in Addis Ababa in July to discuss with Minister of Health of Ethiopia, but largely with the, the continent, about experiences between Francophone Africa, where the, the, the task shifting is more from medical doctors or specialists to medical doctors and compared to English-speaking countries where the, the task shifting is more from medical doctors to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, health officers. And it has been a, a, an extraordinary interesting uh, uh, meeting and this has ended by a call, uh, a call to action. I have a number of copies here for all people interested. And uh, I, I just wanted, if, if you give me one second, uh, to, to highlight two or three things. First of all, that it should not be an ad hoc exercise. And this has been demonstrated by your presentation. This is raising a lot of issues. So we cannot say that it's, a, it's a, an ad hoc thing that you do from today for tomorrow. This needs to have a number of steps. This is also not an ideal strategy. This is a strategy to fill a gap 
but the main strategy should remain in training midwives, particularly, and also doctors, and doctors with curricula adapted to the, situa to the situation. This was clearly mentioned by all the Minister of Health and Director of Programs who were there. And uh, they acknowledge also that this should be put in the context of a large strategy where family planning, skill birth attendant, and emergency obstetric care were the three pillars that now uh, all we agree on from uh, reducing maternal mortality. Uh, it should be also included in the national uh, human resource development plan for health and particularly for maternal and newborn health. And it should be a team approach. And I think this is also something that we, we, we all agree, but we should insist on that. We are not training NPCs in isolation. We are training NPCs to work with midwives and midwives and NPC to work with the team. And only these type of teams include doctors and specialists when there is a need for referring to a tertiary hospital uh, will, will be successful. Um, we need policy, regulatory, mandatory and operational environment. This has been clearly mentioned. We need to strengthen basically all the health system, but human resources is really uh, an important uh, component of the health system. We need to strengthen South-South collaboration, and this was a very good example, but North-South Collaboration is still absolutely necessary in many cases, but regional collaboration uh, have, been, uh, have been highlighted. The last point is quality of care. We need to monitor. These people should not be sent to the field without any support. They should be mentors, they should be supervised, they should be supported. And this is a lot to do. You know that in many African countries, supervision system I fold. During many years, there is no longer supervision in many countries. So we have to really strengthen not only the training and training of, of trainers, which is a, a, a big bottleneck, but also we need to strengthen the system which will support this new, uh, newly uh, dis, uh, um, uh, uh, disseminated health workers. I don't want to be long, but thank you very much for this. Uh, it's a recent history, and it's showing that really the commitment of many governments regarding human resources, which could appear as a, a very impossible challenge, is now changing because these type of strategies are becoming more thought and more implemented with more lessons learned. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, why don't we collect a couple questions and then everyone can reflect on that in there. Sure. Uh, right, right, right next to him, Kayla. Thank you for your presentation, Jeff. I don't know if you remember. I met you in Afghanistan a few years ago um, while you were doing your excellent work. Sorry, can you let us know who you uh, are, too? I'm Jean Capps. I'm an independent consultant in maternal child health. Um, I wanted to ask you something that you alluded to in a few of your bullet points, and this is for the whole group. But the real Achilles heel in Africa right now in the health centers is, for lack of personnel, has to do a lot to do with pay. Uh, routine rotation where you train people and they, are ro they ro rotate it out so you're actually working with untrained people continuously. And in certain cadres, particularly midwives and registered nurses, migration to developed countries. Um, and I saw there was one bullet point that had IMF. And IMF uh, reports have a lot to do about whether the finance minister will give the money to the country to do this and get off the d reliance on donors to pay for it. So if you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. And then way in the back there, yeah. Thanks, Janet. I'm an independent consultant in MNCH. Um, I would like to raise two points. One, I think for gender issues, it is not only access for training, which is a factor, but the availability at peripheral centers. In many countries in Africa, these are men who are the nurses. And while some women don't mind having deliveries by them, others do have some problems, and they often get relegated to the less skilled workers, such as matrons. Which brings me to the second point. I feel that perhaps we could consider that in task shifting, while the four groups are important that were highlighted, I was wondering whether we could have two broad subgroups of skilled workers and the non-skilled workers, because the two cannot be really managed or equated in the same way. Firstly, ministries of health look upon your nurses and midwives and other 
uh, auxiliary nurses in a very different manner to the traditional birth attendants and community health workers. And secondly, while these, the roles of the skilled workers can remain fairly constant for quite some time or they can get upgraded to a certain extent, the roles of the traditional birth attendants and community health workers will change as countries advance because mothers, as they improve, get better educated and the country improves, may selectively go to the more skilled workers. So I think in task shifting, these groups may perhaps need to be considered or dealt with um, as different approaches. Uh, for example, some of the community health workers and traditional birth attendants after some time can still be employed for counseling, detection of danger signs and referral. They may not after some time really be able to render the maternal health services, especially if mothers may go to others as the country advances further. Just respond to all of these, however you like. Or do you? Uh, you want to go first? Um, um, the first one um, addressing, I think you you narrowed it to the health centers. Am I right? So uh, in, in that uh, regulatory framework, uh, spoke will that I had mentioned, um, working condition, recruitment, um, it's very important. Um, there are two types of health workers, um, if we see them by where they get their pay. One, they are civil servants, um, so they, are, they have, um, their money comes from the federal or the state government or the local government. Then the other are contractual workers. They work maybe with an NGO or um, with a private organization. What you have said, yes, it exists. So, um, but that's why it's so important to bring all the stakeholders from the beginning to discuss, meaning the only stakeholder is not the Ministry of Health, but it is the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Finance. Um, you've mentioned the IMF policies that may affect and that affect the hiring of new health workforce, especially in increasing the civil services pool. Um, in some countries that I have been to now in Africa as well as in Asia, that um, uh, in different models, that has been um, addressed um, so that, um, for example, uh, uh, they can increase the number of new cadres that were never there, uh, uh, community health care workers that can work at the health center or at the health post level. But that issue in other countries also exist. So it all depends where where does their um, pay come from. And then the migration issues, it has to be addressed. That's why now WHO is focusing on increasing um, access uh, of health services by retaining workforce in rural, remote, and underserved areas. How can it be done? So it's a complex issue. There's no one single answer to it. It's not, a, uh, since it's not an island, it's not a problem by itself. Uh, the other uh, uh, issue that was, um, why don't we put them skilled and non-skilled? And the skilled, usually their um, uh, core competencies or scope of work remains the same, the, um, the so-called unskilled. It will change, um, I agree. Um, uh, but um, for both, it is so important to put into the framework a continuing medical education or nursing education or community health education. It's very important. Well, whatever name we give them. It's very important to make sure that as the time progresses that their competency match the task that they are uh, supposed to perform. Yeah, um, yeah what I wanted to address one of your questions, I think, um, talked about other ministries' involvement, like Ministry of Finance. Um, this point is extremely important, but, but I think we are also see, beginning to see some progress. I just had Three weeks, four weeks ago, I attended a Goa meeting in Burkina Faso, which I was very impressed because what the, del the all the francophone delegations that came, it was a combination of Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance, civil civil society, civil service, um, and NGO representative, which is a good indication that people are now saying, you know, this is a multi-sectoral thing. This is not just the Ministry of Health doing this. So unless, and unfortunately, the Ministry of Health also happens to be uh, the least skilled in terms of advocacy and when they sit around the table. So we know that story. So which is more important to bring your decision makers, but also the purse holders. 
uh, so that when these decisions are, are made, they are there. But, but again, this is another area where, and, and maybe this is why I think it's part of the momentum, you know, there are so many other sectors that have done better at reaching community at where they are much, you know, the, the, I think the, the Ethiopia model of, of health extension worker was a little bit based on, on ag extension worker model. So we, we have a lot to learn if we focus on really making sure that we recognize that this is a multi-sectoral, um, it needs to be a multi-sectoral approach. Um, and I agree with Sabli on, on the other consideration. I, I think whether they are skilled or non-skilled, in fact, you've got, depending on who, who counts them, who pays them, who, who, who you know, those, those are all very, very big issues. But the reality in most of the underdeveloped world, you've got still a highest percentage of the population um, which really cannot be served by just the people that we are in a position to count. <laughs> and so that's, but the uh, point is well taken. And I do think that you need to do, no matter what group they belong to, you need to address same level of standard of care and, and so forth. Jeff. Just a couple of brief comments. Um, <clears throat> Jean, to, to address one of your issues, which is this a perpetual idea of routine or ritual rotation off service. Um, I think that is a great challenge, and I think that has to be dealt with at the highest levels in, in a country, that, that there, the country is not necessarily served by training a midwife to be a midwife and then putting her on the pediatrics ward. Um, and I think one of the things that we pushed very hard, and I have continued to look at closely in Afghanistan, is allowing, or to another country, right, um, is the issue of allowing midwives to be midwives. Do not broaden the scope of work so far beyond reproductive health that the majority of her time is taken up seeing females with malaria and all ch all child care and et cetera. And then, then it's a, it's a self fulfilling prophecy because the, if she has if she spends all day in the outpatient clinic caring for women with malaria she will not have time to care for a woman in labor, and thus the women in labor will not come, and thus she will not have the opportunity, and thus she will be disskilled, and quickly she will no longer be a midwife, she will be someone who once was a midwife. Um, so I think that is a, is a chronic issue. And to address one of Indira's questions is the mix uh, of, or the, the non-skilled and, and skilled workers. I think sometimes we do well when we mix them together. I think one of the reasons of the interpartum health center strategy was because it is so difficult to supervise and continually support health workers that are widely, widely distributed. And if midwives are doing a lot of home births, it's very difficult to provide them with a logistical and, and supervisory system in which to support them. One of the strategies that we employed years ago in, in Guatemala was to bring traditional birth attendants into the facilities. Let them do the deliveries with a midwife looking over their shoulder. There is no difficult, I have no challenge with having a, a traditional birth attendant standing at the perineum and supporting a woman through a birth as long as there's someone w within an arm's reach who can address critical clinical scenarios if they arise. And so I think sometimes bring, seeing how we can bring teams uh, together, and that's an al mm -hmm. also a way of extending the skills of one midwife. Is you may have one midwife and uh, a number of of other workers in the facility who are supporting births, and the midwife is there providing uh, broader support to the team. Okay, okay a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, right here. Hi, great presentations, folks. I'm Debbie Armbruster from Path. Um, I guess what's a little scary to me is that back when I was a Peace Corps volunteer and entering the profession, I could have heard the same presentation. And I remember a WHO book by somebody named Abbott that talked about essential skills. And he had a big bullseye in there, was the nice to know and the essential and the something. And so I guess what I'd like to hear from you all is what's different now? Why do we think that it's actually gonna work now when we've been at the same thing kind of saying the same thing for, I don't even want to say how long, 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and actually just, if you could pass the microphone, there's a couple people right there, I think. 
Hi, those were great presentations. Linda Bartlett from Johns Hopkins University. My question is mostly for Luke, actually, if that's okay, um, but about the Ethiopian health extension workers, because they were mentioned a couple of times, and I'm not sure if you're mentioning them, mentioning them as an example of skilled birth attendant, because my understanding is that they're not skilled birth attendants. And do you know why Ethiopia chose to uh, train this cadre, which is about a year's education, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, versus midwives. And then just pass it right behind you. Hi, my name is Carolyn Curtis. Uh, the question that I have is in regard to supervision. Uh, and when you're looking at supervision uh, abroad, most of the supervision is external, where you're bringing in supervisors from the district to come in and supervise staff and make their comments and then they're gone. Uh, what's being done in terms of having that supervision be more uh, based in that f particular facility in which the issues around job description uh, expectations can be addressed realistically. And I guess the other is in terms of continuing education, um, that too is a big thing to address, but how can that be done within the facility where you're not necessarily needing to have people sent out and uh, have that, is there some identification of core competencies in which there needs to be continued uh, evidence of uh, good performance or evidence that you have been refreshed uh, uh, on some uh, annual or uh, regularized basis. Um, Deb's question. <laughs> Why will these things work, and what's different today than, than 25 years ago? You know, I, I, I think the fact that, I think donors are working a little smarter. And I, I, and I do think that it matters a lot, because I, I think donor coordination um, is important, and I think um, if, if donors are the drive a lot of these programs, uh, I, I think they're working better and in a more coordinated fashion. And, and I think we are seeing a, a lot more than that. I also think that you've got stakeholders uh, at country levels. Uh, you, at country levels, I think you've got a lot more, um, certainly ownership. We're seeing, um, w we're seeing some examples where real ownership and taking on. And I think when you have that, as demonstrated by Rwanda, those of you who are involved in working in Rwanda, when you've got really local leadership that is strong, that, that has a vision that kind of guide the donors, then you've, you've got better results. So I think these, these generally are, are, are progress. Um, it does seem that the, that the complexity of the problem seems to be bigger because if you throw in migration and, and human rights and who are we to, to stop people from moving if they want to move, then it's, it's, it's more complex. But I, but I do think that a global awareness does contribute to making things better at the country level. And that, so everybody knows that, uh, well, if I'm a doctor and I move to the U.S. and I'm making 10 times more, but I'm also sending remittances back to the countries, then, then it makes the, 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 the it's, it's the living proof that, you know, you re this is not just a, a migration thing, it's an economic thing and it's a poverty thing. So it's, I think, uh, I, I think I in a way, the world being a little bit more connected and, and so global approaches and, you know, information is flowing a lot faster and a lot better than it was. So I put those to the table. <laughs> Maybe not all the answers, but we are asking the same questions, but I think the conditions are changing quite a bit, in my opinion. Um, I, I think you really made a very good statement. I don't want my six-year-old daughter to assemble in this room 20, 25 years from now and say, oh, I heard this, you know, <laughs> and my mom used to tell me every day, you know, what she's doing. Um, but I think time is different right now. Um, 
when I saw the World Health Statistic Report that came out in 2009, and when I saw that uh, um, MDG4, MDG6, there has been a real dent made to them, but MDG5, no. Um, there is a thought that I've been thinking, you know, for the past few years, and there are many good initiatives and progress that have been done in the maternal and child health um, department. And since 2004, uh, there hasn't been a global attention on increasing workforce. There have been so many issues uh, or so many reasons given why there is increased burden of disease, why there is this, you know, from different angles, but not a narrowed down laser beam focus on workforce from different levels, from the doctors down to um, community health care workers level. Now there is, there is that movement um, internationally, regionally, nationally. So if the two can link, you know, and some kind of combustion, chemical combustion can occur, you know, the good initiatives, the amazing, excellent initiatives that are taking within the maternal and childhood community and the health workforce community, I think a dent can be made into this decreasing the maternal and child mortality. The other thing about supervision, I totally agree with you. That's why in one of the spoke wheel diagram that I did, supervision is very important. And internal supervision, not just external supervision, but saying it is easy than doing it, meaning there are not enough healthcare workers, you know, to do it internally. So as that's why I said, as as countries decide which type of healthcare workers that they want to train, they have to decide also at which care site level they want them to work. So that they have to increase and build critical mass at different healthcare sites levels. Then only what you have said, which is true and which is important, can occur. Then only what you have said also about continuing education, you know, not for them not to go outside, but you know, to incorporate it within the facilities that will happen. But till that is uh, addressed, it can't happen. But that should be the goal. Um, just a, a few words, yeah. Um, Deb, I, I, I agree. What's what's different today? And I, I think I'm going to do a corollary of everything I need, really need to know I learned in nursery school and kindergarten. Um, is every, Much of what I needed to know I learned in medical school. I think maybe some of you know I have a bias towards pre-service education. But I think if we don't give people a fundamental proper foundation in their initial training, if we don't give them the right habits from the start, we, they struggle for the rest of their lives to be able to provide good care. And so I think there is a bit more of a focus on pre-service education now. I don't think there has been historically enough of a focus on pre-service education. And if and that, that may be something that could be different today that gives, allows people to have a, a fundamental uh, basis on which to, to practice for the rest of their lives and to be able to learn, have the capacity to learn new skills quickly rather than being taken out all the time and having to learn things that they should have learned um, before. And um, Carolyn, regarding supervision, um, I, I know I think people, the, the, the challenge of external supervision is is an issue of human resources. There aren't enough people. So I think we have to look at internal mechanisms that people understand what they need to do and have some re internal resources um, by which they're able to monitor their own practice or work collaboratively with other people. Many, in many situations, they're the only provider of reproductive health services in the facility. So other people in the facility don't necessarily have the capacity to provide supervision, but um, if they have some kind of internal resources, guidelines, or, or tools that we've used, like operational standards, for being able to monitor or measure their own performance, then that can move us a little bit forward. Luke, would you mind clarifying that question real quick? Thanks. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Could you allow me to also add some words to the response to, to Deborah? Just very briefly, because I think she knows very well the, the, the response. And let me, let me say what I think about that. I think we have never really invested in health systems. We have to think about Almata, we have to think about all this experience that the world has gone through. We know that programs like HIV, child health, have tried to avoid to invest really in health systems. And now we are at the limit of what could be achievable if you don't really strengthen the health system. PMTCT cannot do progress if we don't invest in maternal and, and child health programs. 
for example. So the need to invest in health system is now very clear, and we are forced to do that. Someone says that uh, maternal health was a gender issue. I think it could be a gender issue why maternal health has never been uh, really uh, well addressed. It's not only, uh, uh, in my ways, in, it's not only a gender issue. I think it's also an issue of development. You can develop a country without strengthening the health system. And we are at this stage where we need to invest in health systems. Also, the point is to invest in public services. And you know that countries have been asked to limit the recruitment of public, uh, of uh, civil servant by the FME, by the World Bank, etc. All this is a, a very difficult uh, discussion about sailings to recruit civil servants in the country, etc. So, as, as Pepe said, it's, uh, it's an economic issue. It's also an ideological issue. And, and uh, yeah, okay, this is my word. Now, uh, thank you, Linda, for your question about Ethiopia. Uh, um, uh, this gives me uh, two minutes additional to be more precise about that and to indicate to you that, in, a, in addition to the NPC training program, uh, there is a big move to invest in midwifery training in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. which has been a long process to convince the government that expanded health workers are no, not no, no. skilled birth attendants. And you can expand the skills, you can train more to do things. We are talking about misoprostol at community level, we are talking about family planning methods like implanon at community level, etc. They will never become skilled bus attendant. So it's, it seems that uh, now the government of Ethiopia is convinced that the health expanded workers should be backed by midwives. And there is now a big program to train because they, have, they said that they have big numbers of nurses. So they want to train nurses into midwifery. We don't know yet, there is no yet agreement on the number of months for the training. I think Jeff has made the point very clear mm -hmm. that we cannot accept three months training for nurses to become a midwife. So this is still a big discussion. But the midwifery schools, 29 midwifery schools have started to be rehabilitated, starting with seven. And I just mentioned to add to what Pep say, was saying that another uh, partnership, which is quite important, funded by Sweden, is a partnership between UNFPA and ICM, the International Confederation of Midwives, and we are placing in many countries in Africa particularly, but also in Southeast Asia, midwifery advisor to put the midwifery profession as really an important issue for the government. So this is also part of the move. So thank you for your question. Okay, we've got time for a couple more. Let's go all the way in the back there, Kevin. Take those two questions right there in the back. Thank you. I'm Dunyo Luwale from Africa's Health in 2010 AED. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment on the issue of task shifting when it comes to selection of the individuals to, sh to shift the task to, especially referring to the experience in Mozambique of training the surgical technicians. We know that they have done extremely well. But one of the factors that contributed to success was attention to the selection of the midwives. And I, I really didn't hear much about this in the discussion. And I wondered whether this was something that any one of you could comment on, not only with respect to Mozambique, but in the different countries where you have worked. Okay, and if you could just pass the microphone right over there. Thank you. Hi, Lindsay Grenier from the American College of Nurse Midwives. I just actually wanted to follow on to Jeff's comment about pre-service and point out that perhaps even more than the shortage of healthcare workers, we have a worldwide faculty shortage and teaching shortage. And that in anything that we talk about with human resources, training and education is always the background of that. So as we think about strategies for deploying people and keeping them in service, I think Thinking, starting to think more and more about teachers and how to mm -hmm. recruit clinicians to be teachers mm -hmm. is really important too. We're implementing some projects right now and what we're really seeing is that almost all of the teachers are entering directly from school with no clinical experience because you can't um, recruit clinicians because they make less as teachers. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. I'd love to hear them too. But more comments. Okay, and let's just uh, finish up right here. I think. Hi, I'm Deborah Gordis from CARE, and uh, everybody's called for training more midwives and better training of midwives, and I think it, for our long term, so that we're not continually chasing our tails, we need to also advocate for the education of girls so that we have enough girls coming out of secondary school who can you know, be recruited into nursing, midwifery, and medical schools. Um, I was at that meeting, Luke, in um, I guess it was June, um, uh, July, the task shifting, the um, you know, CMOC for um, non-physician clinicians. And one of the things that struck me there, at least the first day, was that the, um, many of the ministerial representatives were very anxious about um, the reaction of the different professional associations to making this kind of a move, you know, that you know, the anesthesiologist didn't want anybody else providing anesthesia and so on, and um, as if there aren't enough pregnant women to go around. And I was wondering, okay. Sebley, in, in your work, you know, has that, you know, indeed, you know, been a big, as big an issue as it kind of seemed at that meeting, you know, that they would go back to their countries and, you know, have tomatoes thrown at them? Or is it, you know, something that, you know, with, you know, getting stakeholders involved at the beginning, you know, can be um, sort of put to rest? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Th I'm glad you brought the issue of, of teachers and tutors. And in fact, this is an area where, in my opinion, we could actually do, make a little bit more progress. Um, but this also points out to one difficulty that we have. A lot of the projects that we participate in tend to be kind of a bilateral in nature. And the human resources issue is everything except bilateral. It is so regional because people move in several countries and it's global. So I wish the donors could start focusing a little bit more on initiative that would be more fluid in looking at, you know, can you just imagine countries that have a surplus that could, you know, there, there, I think there are a lot of <coughs> even return Peace Corps volunteers. I think we could tap into Peace Corps as I think they have a program designed to send people that have already served to go back and and I think in this area we could certainly th there are a lot of there are a lot more um, these volunteer groups coming in for medical missions so I think that's one area that with a little bit more creativity we could actually be be solving uh, some of the problems but it's it is it is a big it, this is this would be kind of a, one of the root cause analysis root cause solution because we know that until we have people we're capable of teaching, then we, we won't have good uh, training programs. And the selection, Ole, you, that this is so right. I mean, I think I alluded it very, very quickly that sometimes the selection, of course, is biased. People are not, because again, people see training as another way to supplement the salary or whatever. So it's a perks, and so it does influence the selection. But I agree with you. I think it's extremely important to pay better attention to it. Uh, for for sake of time, I'll focus on one of the issues. And, and Lindsay, I, I, I appreciate your bringing up the issue of teachers. I think sometimes the challenge lies in the fact that the Ministry of Health, who employs people, is separate from the Ministry of Education which runs the schools and I think that that's less of an issue under uh, for midwifery or nursing education because they often are under Ministry of Health but we also haven't um, we haven't valued teachers in, in I, I work predominantly in Asia where you know teachers are viewed as gurus but not to the same extent nursing teachers and midwifery teachers and so they don't they're not compensated, they're not paid appropriately, and they're not integrated into the service delivery system. It's clinical teachers or tutors are, are quite separate from classroom teachers, and I think there needs to be an effort to bring that back together, because the only, the job of a, of a health education faculty is to provide both health care and education, they have to do both. Um. I'll just say one thing about what Doyen has said. I totally agree. That's why my, I think, second last slide, I said um, it's not just scaling up. Whom do we, whom mm. should be recruited? That question has to be answered. And like you've mentioned the case in Mozambique with countries 
intend to scale up their workforce, they have to decide whom they are going to scale up. Um, just to add on the faculty shortage, again, when countries decide to scale up, it is the doctors, nurses, midwives, and all. But at the same time, there should be a parallel track to increase the faculty. Almost every country now, I've gone in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's an acute shortage of faculty. So what are the mechanisms to recruit them and to retain them? You know, strategies and policies regarding that need to be developed. Um, I totally agree about education of girls. Um, um, Sometimes I feel it's the key to many things. It will solve many things. Not because I'm a, mom, I'm a woman, but I think it will solve many things. And uh, especially the last part of task shifting, we're talking about task shifting for. Um, involvement of the professional associations, it is critical. They can block everything from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So what's the key that there is, is bringing them from the beginning on the table when decision is going to be made. Okay, if a country has decided we need to create this type of healthcare workers and their competency should be this, who's going to set the competencies? It's the, either the professional council or the professional associations. That competency, whatever competency that's going to be um, decided to be developed, it has to be discussed. Mm -hmm. in an, so no one um, ministerial agency or no one department holds everything or knows the answer. Mm -hmm. if, if they go into the meeting with that mentality, mentality, that, that's it. it. I mean, they will go out with yeah. nothing uh, being so. But if they bring the initial stakeholder, the most important stakeholder from the beginning and addressing the issues, you know, which I'm sure the professional councils and the professional associations know about it. But if they are included in the decision-making process from the beginning, then they will be facilitators and not inhibitors. And we've seen this in countries that have... Um, well, I know there's more questions, and I apologize that we can't get to all of them. But uh, thanks, everyone, for coming, for all your great questions. And please help me in thanking our presenters. <laughs>